It's what they say. Uh -oh. Amen. oh no. Oh, Yay. There we go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 we don't want to lose our feet. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Bob would have gotten us a fan. Okay. <laughs> no, I promised I would announce at least twice on the 14th in preparation for the uh, homecoming, which is Sunday the 7th of November. Uh, there will be a second cleaning the week before the regular cleaning here. And the week after uh, the, the ladies, regular. pardon? The week after the regular cleaning. That's what I said, but the regular cleaning is the week before, which it's is what I said. Came <laughs> I gave the right dates. Don't ask for more. <laughs> but I do. <laughs> so the 14th, and uh, the ladies who have been faithfully cleaning have asked for a little additional help. Or it's a big space up there. So if you're free and you can come, uh, God will bless you for being a servant in his house. You know, David was proudly, uh, he said he would be satisfied if he was but a doorkeeper in the house of God. Yeah. Uh, there, there are great privileges to serving God in small ways. Amen. And God, God is not a despiser of small things. Come and give it your best effort, and we will not despise you either. We will thank God for you, okay? Uh, I did something this week that I have never done before, which, when you get to be our age, there aren't many things in that category. <laughs> uh, I named the message, and then I Googled it. It's the Googling part I usually don't bother with. I had a suspicion. Uh, boundaries is one of the words of our day. Uh, it used to be self-image, and there are other things that we passed through. Now it's boundaries. And I typed in Christian boundaries, which is the, the title. There are hundreds of entries, and I scanned a few of them, because I didn't want to spend the rest of the day looking at these things. And some of them have good things to say, and some of them have really not but the concept of a boundary, you probably know in our day and time, is that we take control of our lives by setting boundaries. Uh, we used to call it, let's see, there's no new thing under the sun. We used to call it drawing a line in the sand, right? Yeah. And if you're old enough, you remember that. We, 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 I'm just going to draw a line in the sand, meaning this is I'm not putting up with any more of this, right? Line in the sand. Um, and the people used to say that around me never explained that the reason for drawing a line in the sand is to buy you to step over it, right? Yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> okay, Dad, if you want to draw a line in the sand, mm -hmm. God bless you. Uh, <laughs> but Christian boundaries, I want to explore. I, it may take the next three messages, this one or two more, uh, because it's so important. In chapter 12, Paul says a lot about how we are to live this Christian life. And I want you to understand that the Christian life is a life of grace. So what Paul is doing is not giving 10 or 20 additional commandments. So you need to understand that. So you have to, you, you have to understand what he's saying. And a lot of the foundation for what he's saying, each and every verse builds upon verse 1 and 2. So forgive me if I refer back to it from time to time. And I'm going to start there this morning, if you don't mind. In the second verse... Paul invites the Romans not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewal of their mind. And what he's talking about, we went over lightly before, but let me open it up a little bit for you. Conformity, you understand. I'm, I'm assuming you understand. Conformity is like fitting in. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, don't fit into this world. Well, the word there for world is eon. It, literally eon. It's the Greek word eon from which we get a long period of time, an eon. Uh, and some people, at some points in the scripture, translate eon as world because it seems like the eon being referred to and the history of the world are about the same thing. But the word doesn't really mean world. It just has implications for a period of time which can be as long as from creation to the end of the earth. All right? 
But the magic of this verse, if you'll allow me to use that non-spiritual word, but the, uh, let me, I should just say the power of this verse lies in the fact that uh, it works in every eon. Because you and I live in a time where life has changed every five seconds sometimes, if you like. We sound like uh, centurions, you know, people lived a hundred years sometimes when we talk about, because we remember things that our kids can hardly imagine. <laughs> Uh, you know, we we know what it means to dial a phone. <laughs> we know what it is to have black and white TV. Uh, we know what it was to drive without four-way stops. You remember a time when there wasn't every road had one had road had to dominate or another, or we put a light in. But there was no such thing as a four-way stop. Uh, we know that. People didn't always eat Brussels sprouts. Only rare, pe only Italians, I think, actually, where I came from, ate Brussels sprouts. And now they're one of the most popular things out there. You know, you broil them in the oven with a little butter and garlic, and they're so good. Who knew? Who knew? I remember the first time I went to a party, and uh, on the buffet table there were raw vegetables. Mm -hmm. I was raised by an English cook. What you do with vegetables is boil the life out of them. That's what you do with a vegetable. Why would you serve me a raw piece of asparagus? Or a cauliflower? I mean, cook the thing. And then just because we conform, we try to fit in. I had a piece of cauliflower uncooked. Oh, that's good. And if you've got a great dip, it's even better, right? So. In our time, life has changed. And what this verse tells me, that no matter how much the world decides to change, in any age, in any eon, there is a world out there that I might choose to conform myself to. And Paul says, don't do that. Be transformed. Now, let's talk a little bit about what it is to be transformed. The word for transform is exactly this in the original. Metamorphosis. A, a, a metamorphosis. Now, again, when we were young, the only metamorphosis we knew was if we were classical scholars, we might know how people were changed into trees and things like that. But generally, we studied it in science class. We put a, 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 a worm, a caterpillar, in a jar. It made a chrysalis. It opened up and became a beautiful butterfly. So to us, that's what a metamorphosis is. It's taking something lowly, something everyday, something, and making something beautiful out of it. And it works for this passage, too. God says, take what you are through the mouth of Paul and let it blossom into a new mind. Now, it's not till verse 3 that he really gives us an idea of what that's all about. Because... You could go anywhere with that if you had, if you were just assuming what it meant. Of course, the best place would be that, to, to think that Paul is calling us to have a transformation of our way of thinking uh, in the direction of our newfound faith, right? And that's really where it's going, but I, I would rather Paul tell me that than me to imagine that. So the first three is going to be uh, very helpful to us. In verse 3... Paul says, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more, humbly, more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Not only is that a powerful verse in and of itself, but it really, if you throw away the chapters that are man-made, it's part of a bookend of a previous thing. Because when we study in chapter 11, we read in verse 25, lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. And then he goes on to talk about the mystery that God has allowed his people, the Jewish people, uh, to, to become only a remnant of faith until the end of his purpose is when he will bring the whole nation in. Okay? And that's just a, a quickie on what we studied back then. But you see, in both cases, 
Um, it'll come back on. Because I have it on Energy Saver, I realize. Uh, in both cases, Paul is concerned that we not be so full of ourselves because, after all, we're Christians and we know who Jesus is and we know this and we know that and other people don't know it and other people have wrong thinking that uh, we end up sinning against other people. We end up with wrong thoughts. We end up with, what was the word I spent a lot of time on? Arrogance. <coughs> And arrogance is a harmful, harmful, damaging thing. And we don't want that. So here he's, he's saying again, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought. The transformation of the mind, the metamorphosis, the metamorphosis of your mind that Paul is calling for is one that takes you from a mental uh, state wherein you think like the world thinks in your particular space and time, to a place where you think God's thoughts after him and suddenly you realize that God is God and I am not. And only humility remains. Mm -hmm. see? Uh, we need to be shooting not to be the smartest book on God's shelf, but to be the most appreciative, mm -hmm. the humblest book on that shelf. The one that says, I don't know why God placed me on this shelf with all these others, but I'm glad to be here. Uh, and so, he's going to teach about how we should live this Christian life, but the backdrop has to be that the living of the Christian life is not life in the world where my goal is to get to the top of the pack. My goal is to take the faith that God has given me and live it out. If I never get noticed by other Christians, I, the world will notice you, because they don't see a lot of God. But if I ever get noticed by other Christians, so what? God has revealed himself to me, and by faith I believe. I don't need more than that. Humility allows me to serve God wherever I am, whoever I am, however he needs me to serve. I was privileged years ago to know a man that you will never, ever, ever, ever find in your human histories of the church. There are very few people on the planet Earth who know this name and will remember it. And I know when I get to glory, he's going to have a front seat. Because he was a gentle and humble servant of God who never failed to remember God's grace to him. His name was Ralph Bragdon. He was the brother-in-law of Francis Schaeffer, which may mean something to some of you. Francis Schaeffer was one of our most valued writers and thinkers in the previous century in the Christian community. Um, and uh, later on did some video series that were seen and viewed in, in churches all across America. How shall we now live? How shall we then live? Then live? Yeah, and, and things like that. Uh, Francis was also a humble servant of God, but God had a purpose for him that put him out in front where people read his books and listened to what he had to say. Ralph was his brother-in-law. Ralph grew up without any real knowledge of God and the things of God. He, he wasn't a professional sinner. He was just a sinner like the rest of us. But he didn't know anything about God. And his wife was Francis, Francis Schaeffer's wife's sister. Okay? Did I lose you on that? <laughs> Sister-in-law to Francis Schaeffer. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the family connection was Ralph's wife. And uh, she was on a journey taking herself deliberately away from God when they met and married. It's not for me to say whether she was saved, but she did, in the language of the evangelical community of those days, come back to God. And Francis Schaeffer led his brother-in-law to Christ. Francis never forgot that. Everything that he 
adored, everything that he valued, everything that uh, made him who he was from that time on goes back to his conversion. And he was ever so thankful that his brother-in-law was used by God to reach him for Christ. Amen. He was not a pastor. He never wrote a book. To my knowledge, he never led a Bible study. He was neither an elder nor a deacon. He was a man of God. And when he studied the scripture, God spoke to his heart consistently. And he would come and um, come to some of the younger adults. from time to time. And he would say, in my studies of the Bible this week, I read this. He said, I just have to share what God is saying. And he would tell you what he learned from that and, and how it was affecting his thinking and his life. But it was never, I'm telling you this. I'm sh it was, you knew he was sharing his life with God, with you. Uh, in fact, he gave more attention to the young adults in the church, those who are starting out in marriage, starting out in business after having, that, that age, after having been in college, whatever, than anybody in that church. Because the rest of them took them for granted. You know, they grew up in the church, so it was going to be here. Some of that stuff is really bad to take for granted, you know. Uh, people will drift. But Ralph would come and he would show you something in God's Word. That even if you didn't get it when he first said it, it would haunt you for the rest of the week until you opened up your Bible, read it for yourself, and buried it deep in your heart. God used him that way. And when he came down with the cancer that took him to glory. Uh, towards the end of, of life, he was in a coma. And those same young adults that had been so blessed by him put together a, a chain of service where every hour of every day, his last four or five days, one of us, or a married couple, was with him in that hospital even though he was in a cult, because of what we owed to him for what God had done for him. How could we be? Never saw one of the older people there. And I, I don't mean to judge them. I just want you to understand. The young people took this on voluntarily on themselves because he was spiritual father to them all. And when I went for my term, I remember sitting there thinking, Okay, what do I do to kill the time with a man who's in a coma? It was a new thing for me. What do I do? Well, I can pray. I managed to stretch that to half an hour. I had three and a half hours yet to kill. What do I do? And I was sitting there thinking, and I remembered the last thing that he shared with me was from Philippians. But I couldn't remember where it was in Philippians. I couldn't remember exactly what it was. But I remember that as he knew he was a dying man, he shared this, and it meant the world to him. So I said, you know, that's what I need to do. I need to read this in his presence. And the nurse came in, and we had to uh, give him a suppository. And I helped in that process. That's humbling yourself when you're not a nurse and you're not used to this kind of thing. And he was totally unresponsive. But they knew he was in pain and they wanted him to have some relief. So we did that and then I, she left and I'm again with a man in a coma in a hospital room. So I started to read for this. And when I got to the point that he had shared with me, it all came back. And I, I looked over to smile at him for what he had shared with me and the fact 
that I had this jewel from him. And this man in a coma was crying. Because people in comas, we're told, can often hear and perceive what's going on even if they cannot respond to it. His tears were the only response, and they were tears of joy. Because he was going to meet the God who said this, you see. This was a man who didn't think very highly of himself. But we did because God used him in his humility. It's a sad thing, but sometimes we leave young people, men and women, with the idea that they have to have a title in the church in order to be successful for God. No. Some people would be better off without the title. Yeah. To be successful for God is to allow God to enter into your mind and into your life and for God to tell you what to think and how to think. And we live in a time where, you know, I haven't lived in all the time, so this is a pastor thing to say, but I dare say people who call themselves Christians today are more likely to put their thinking above God thinking than any time I've ever experienced in my life. And I run into people who claim to be Christians who renounce whole portions of scripture because it doesn't say what they think or what they agree with. And maybe Paul did have to deal with that. Maybe this is why Paul had to say, I urge you I appeal. I'm pleading with you. Don't be conformed to the thinking of this world. Children, this world is passing away. Get your mind in gear with the, with the God who will never pass away and who has given you eternal life and learn now to live and to think as He does. The faith that he has given you needs to be exercised in, you, in your life, not to bring praise to yourself, but to praise the one who gave you his son on the cross. It makes a big difference how we live our Christian life, not simply that we have a Christian life. There will be in glory who are there because of the grace of God alone. Paul tells us in Corinthians, some will be saved as through the fire. Yeah. And if you ever had a fire in your neighborhood, you know exactly what he's talking about. These are the people who stand outside and talk to the newspaper people and say, we lost everything, but we all got out. Yeah. And that's important. Getting out is important. I don't want to die in a fire. I really, you know, there's a, I have a, sh a list of things, ways I don't want to die. <laughs> but I don't tell God because God tends to laugh at my list. So. Yeah. My preference would be to go quietly in my sleep. Yeah. It's not probably going to happen, but that's my preference. But to be in glory and have nothing but God will be a wonderful thing, but it will not be what it could be. God wants to place on you crowns of glory for the works that you did in His name at His instigation. The life that you live to show others what God's grace really means. That's what He wants to do. You. But if you're arrogant, if you think as a Christian you're all that, it's not going to happen. In fact, some of the most prominent Christian leaders in our lifespan have fallen great distances because of such an arrogance. Because they forgot that it's all about what God can do in me, not what I can do. Mm. I may play the best rockabilly piano in the industry, 
but if I'm not living for Christ and my private life is not right, it doesn't mean anything. And it doesn't honor God. And I think God allows some of this garbage to come out because He loves the people who are arrogant too. And there's always the hope that they'll learn something. My experience is that er truly arrogant people are slow learners. So Paul is preparing, he's going to tell us how to live the Christian life. But he does not want us to be people who take notes and go home and check off lists. The how to live the Christian life is the life itself. It's not my smarts. It's learning to live and breathe God's will and way in my life. We're going to talk about some of these, but I'll give you an example from, from Paul's letter. The first one, uh, oh, he further sets the stage. He says uh, that we, in, in one body, there are many members and members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, image, individually members one of another. So, this is something Paul says other places too. He wants us to understand that Jesus is the head, so nobody else gets that position. The rest of us need to get in line and do what God has designed us to do. Right? Everyone has a part to play in the body of Christ. Everyone. No exception. In many places in Scripture, they're referred to as the gifts. The gifts that you have. Let me say this about gifts, just in general. And every time I hit the word gifts, I'll probably tell it to you again. There's a lot of bad teaching out there about what gifts are. Gifts are not the things that I do and don't ask me to do anything else. There is no gift out there that God, by His Holy Spirit, will not exercise through you if He wants to. Okay? The gifts are not the things we like to do. A very prominent preacher that I like a lot said that out loud one time, and I was so disappointed. He said people were asking him, he was doing a series on gifts, well, what are the gifts? And, you know, they, he could listen from the Bible colors and I could and all that kind of stuff. But he said, basically, at the end of the day, you will know your gift because it's the thing you enjoy doing. That, my friends, is nonsense. One of the things that God has used me to do is counsel others. I am not cut out for counseling. My wife could tell you that. A counselor listens. <laughs> I am your typical American male. Listening is a full-time exercise. When I counsel somebody, it's because by God's grace, I exhaust every bit of listening energy I have because I know that's what I have to do. And God has used it, so I know it's a gift. By the way, that's what a gift is. Something that when you do it, and do it regularly, God uses in the body of Christ. But when the council league leaves, I am a dish rack. <laughs> I am exhausted from not letting my mind go to other things. You know, I, just like you now listening to me, some of you may be thinking about, what was I going to make for lunch? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's the way we're made, right? Yeah. Uh, but you can't do that in a counseling situation. No. Somebody might finally say the thing you need to hear to help them with their problem, and you're trying to figure out how to get to the mechanic to have your muffler fixed. It doesn't work. So I put all my energy. Gifts do not make things easy for you. They make them glorious for God. That's what they are about. Still, if you have a gift, there are things uh, that Paul wants you to know. Verse 6, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. Gifts, spiritual gifts, are only given by God. If somebody tells you, uh, do you want to speak in tongues, I'll teach you how to speak in tongues. Run away. Not because it's wrong to speak in tongues, but because you do not teach a spiritual gift. A spiritual gift comes from the Holy Spirit alone. And nobody human is dispensing them. You follow me on that one?
experience the most, people who feel sorry for me that I don't speak in tongues. I can teach you. No, you can't. <laughs> when God decides to speak for me in tongues, then God will do that. And if God decides to do that. Um, but we have these different gifts, and uh, God has given them to us. That's His will and way in our life. And it's a good thing to know what your gift is. And the best way to find out, this is all the short course you get, <laughs> which was not planned. But I know you're going to want to know this. The best way to find out what your gift is, or gifts, the Bible never says you only get one. You get at least one, but it never says you only get one. Is to get feedback from the body of Christ as to what your ministry has done for them. If you have a gift of teaching, they will tell you at the end of a Bible study, I don't think I ever would have seen that if you hadn't shared it with me, that kind of thing, you know. Um, we'll talk about others as we go along, but it, the feedback from the body that your gift is blessed of God is the best way to know what your gift is. He said, let's, let's use them as he gave them to us. Well, what's he saying? Go back to the beginning. Not with arrogance. With humility. Humility probably means that I don't walk up to you and say, hey listen, I have the gift of such and such and I'm going to exercise that gift in your life. You just do it. Relying on God and God alone. So he says uh, about a gift that Paul always uh, value prophecy. Now, in the New Testament, prophecy is both prophecy as we think of it, but it's more often prophecy wherein the speaker declares what God has said. So it's preaching. Okay? He said, if that's your gift, use it in proportion of your faith. In other words, give it your spiritual all. Don't wing it. <laughs> Don't think because I have a gift, all I have to do is open the Bible and, you know, that rarely works. Uh, God will allow it to work for His glory sometimes, but that's not what He wants for you. The story was told in seminary about a man who used to brag as a preacher that all the time he needed to put a sermon together was the time it took him to walk from the parsonage next door to the church. <laughs> the elders built him a house across town. <laughs> you, you understand, right? Yeah, there, there was arrogance. Um, and it exists. But if, if you are one that God uses to declare His Word to others, do it humbly and do it as fully as you possibly can. Both of those things. If God has given you the diaconate, the ability to serve others, which I find comes with a with a wonderful insight into what people's real needs are, because you know it'd be easy to think that that we were serving others simply because we run around and do nice things for others. But Sister Susie may not need my cake recipe, let alone my cake. She may need me to volunteer to babysit for her kids. Yeah. Because <laughs> she needs a break. The person with a, with a gift of service knows what the priority is. The cake reflects well on me. The time with her kids is just me and the kids. And unless I kill them, no one will ever know. <laughs> uh, but God will know. Yeah. yeah. You, you follow this? I hope you are. Um, if one teaches, and teaching um, is different than prophecy, by the way. Uh, in a sense, if you want to be really cheap about it, prophecy is saying what God says. Teaching is helping you understand what God said. Uh, put you all into your teaching, he says. That's your gift. Give it everything you've got. I have a father-in-law who's, what is he, year 88? 
88 years old. Wow. Like a lot of people his age, he's lucky if he can sleep four hours at a shot. Usually it's two to three. And you know, what you do then is you get up. Many people in his bracket will just move to their favorite chair and fall asleep in the living room. This man goes to the dining room table and takes down a commentary of the Bible, his note, and he studies God's word until it drops. This man is a teacher. And he's concerned that when he teaches, you understand what he's being taught. He taught in the junior high that we used to have as an art teacher. I've seen him agonize over the, the lesson plans to make them, make his audience want to do it well. And a teacher is teaching in the name of God, is teaching so that you can live the life of God well. The goal is not so that the class leaves and taps you on the back, which is always nice, but that's not the goal. The goal is so when you leave, you know more about the good Lord that we serve than you knew when you came in here. Because God gave you this gift and you're using it as best you can. Are some teachers better than other teachers? Oh my, yes. Some teachers who have no gift at all from spirit, of a spiritual nature are good talkers and people think they're good teachers. But you find out later, people in their classes never retain the thing. A good teacher leaves something behind in their classes. And I could go on for a while, but we have other weeks, and I've got to go back. Just to understand this, that as Christians, we're not conformed to the world because the world is setting an agenda that is not about God. But our mind needs to be transformed to line up with a God who made this world even though he knew we were going to mess it up. A God who had a plan for redeeming man after we messed it up. A God who carefully planned his plan throughout all of human history till the time of Christ, which in Galatians is called the fullness of time, at just the right time, at just the right moment. God did what he had been planning to do all along. and. Big news, he did it in the person of his own dear son. Our mind is shaped by a God who sacrificed himself for us, who allowed himself to be contaminated with our sin, to be punished for our sin, to experience separation from his father that he had never known and will never know again, that caused him great agony and to cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me for us? We serve a God who even after having given his life that we might be forgiven, didn't stop being God. And on the third day, our God got up out of the tomb. Amen. And he walked the streets just like he had before. And he showed us what lay ahead of us because he came here in this glorified body so that at one time he looked exactly like himself and at another time people didn't always see him for himself because there was so much glory there. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of life he has for you in his presence, by the way. We serve a God who went back to heaven and continued in the person of his son to live as us. He is the man in the glory. He is the person in heaven who is there for us so that we might have His Father there for us, so that we might have His Spirit by us. We serve a God who's coming back in a world where people walk out on each other all the time. We serve a God who is coming back in glory that we might be where He is with Him. We, have, we serve a God who's gone away to prepare a place for us. For us! Go figure! 
Some of us in this room wouldn't even do things for others in this room that we can do, let alone make a whole new place for us to live with. He did that. And then he said, you know, the only reason I'm going away to make a place for you is because I intend to come back and take you there. <laughs> I don't waste my time on useless projects. I'm going away to make a place for you because I'm coming back to take you there. Amen. We serve a God who gives us hope that will never be disappointed. And in the midst of the pandemic, as people that we know and love and care for are, is dying, as in the midst of the aging process, as people that we know and love are, are coming to the end of their life, in, in a fallen world where one bad decision at an intersection can take out three of people that we care about. And you know, I could go on and on. We nevertheless have the confidence that God is in control. And we see what He has done with His control, and we say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. And so we go out and serve Him to bring Him glory, not to bring us glory. So that we can tell others just how proud we are of our Father in Heaven and our Savior in Heaven and our Holy Spirit guides and directs us. We can, we can do all of that because we have a mind that realizes God is God.